Is it possible to make a heated bed for a 3D printer for under 10 US dollars? And how difficult could that possibly be? That's what we are going to find out in this video. And yes, I actually spent $20 on a better microphone, but not before spending an equal amount on 2000 LEDs. Today, I want to talk about the issues I ran into trying to build the bait heater for my budget 3D printer and how to solve them. Yes, we're just going to waffle in this episode because I have the feeling if I try to explain and act in the same video, it'll just end up like half an hour long again and that'll be too much of an opportunity for my chronic perfectionism to screw me over again and make my life miserable. But I promise it'll be interesting, cause at its core, a heater is really nothing but a wire with current flowing through it, so you'd think, just capped on tape some wire to the underside of the build plate and be done, but guess what, even something as simple as that is almost impossible to do with only 10 bucks. Why 10 bucks specifically? Because that's what I currently have left of the $50 budget I set for this project. And with that out of the way, let's start where things derailed in episode 7 by watching the clip I ultimately had to cut out. Ashback. Anyway, last but most importantly, we need to figure out how to get this glass plate heated up to 120 degrees Celsius without spending a single dollar. That actually proves quite difficult because at 335 by 246 millimeters, this heated bed is pretty similar area wise to a standard 300 by 300 millimeter heater pad. And aside from costing 30 bucks, those things gobble up a mind boggling 350 watts. Problem is, the ATX power supply I'm using for this printer has a total output power of only 340 watts. 40 of which I need to reserve for the hot end. So my DIY heated bed would be underpowered. And considering I need to use a really long run of heater wire anyway to get an even heat distribution, the only logical solution would be to kill both birds with one stone and make a mains powered heater to eliminate the need for a power supply entirely. I'm not going to do that. With the janky construction I'm going for, a mains powered heater would add to the inherent fire hazard a very real risk of electric shock. And that's just one too many exciting features on a single machine. We need to make do with low voltage. Problem is, ATX power supplies like this one have their total power output spread across three power rails. We can pull 12 amps from the 12 volt rail, 19 amps at 5 volts, and 24 at 3.3. If I put aside 4 amps on the 12 volt rail for the hot end, I'm left with 8 amps, which is nowhere near enough for the heated bed. So I came up with a crazy plan. I'm going to make a dual voltage heater and max out the 5 and 3.3 volt rails on this supply. Now incidentally it says on this label here the combined power on those rails should not exceed 160 watts, so I guess that's my biggest limitation here. 160 watts for a heated bay this size is extremely low. It's not even half of what it should have per square centimeter. I have no idea if it's even enough to heat this pane of glass up to 120 C continually. I guess there's technically two ways to find that out, but I'm not gonna take the complicated math route. Let's just try it out instead. End of flashback. Okay, but where's the problem, you might ask? Well, in editing this section about the silicone heater pads, I wanted to screen record some b-roll showing what heater pads I was talking about, except there were none. There were no silicone heater pads for $30 that gobble up 350 watts. I don't know what went wrong when I wrote the script. I did check AliExpress, which is where I got those numbers from, but it must have been just that one oddball heater that never turned up again in the algorithm. And while that's annoying but fixable, it was only the beginning of a landslide. You see, the majority of the heater pads I did find were running on mains voltage instead of 12 volts and consuming a staggering 500 to 750 watts. And that really made my faith in getting it to work with a measly 160 watts plummet. On some website I read, heated beds should have between 0.4 and 0.6 watts per square centimeter, but considering the area of my glass build plate, 160 would have been less than 0.2. So the real problem here is the power supply. It's just nowhere near powerful enough, even though it's the most powerful one I have. I'm not one of the people who have a junk drawer full of expensive CNC components, and spending 30 of the $50 total on a PSU is clearly out of the question. 
Also, a quick side note, because my earlier explanation of how I wanted to make that dual voltage heater wasn't complete, the idea was to configure two separate heaters on the build plate, something like this, so one side gets heated with 5 volts and the other with 3.3. And to make those, I wanted to tape this thick enameled copper wire to the underside of the glass using Kapton tape. But anyway, with my hopes low of getting this dual voltage approach to work, I did some preliminary calculations to see how much copper wire I would need when the final blow came. Temperature coefficient. I had not considered how much of an impact the temperature coefficient of the wire I was going to use would have. You see, the lower the voltage of a high power system, the lower the resistance of the load needs to be in order to get enough current flowing. And to make 19 amperes flow at 3.3 volts, the heating element would only have 0.173680 ohms. Which is why I chose copper in the first place. A side effect of these low resistances is, every milliohm added by wiring from the PSU to the heat bed, the MOSFETs required to switch it on and off, and the temperature coefficient of the heating element itself result in a significant power drop slash loss. Copper has a temperature coefficient of roughly 0.4% per degree Celsius, which means, if I'm not totally off my rocker, a 100 degree increase for a maximum temperature of 120 C results in 40% more resistance of the heating element, thus 30% less power dissipation. And as you can guess, 70% of too little to begin with might not be enough. And I couldn't design the heater to pull 160 watts in its heated up state, because then, at room temperature, it would need more power than the supply can deliver. So, with the realization of my dual voltage ATX solution being a losing game, I finally came to terms with the fact that I would have to go with the more dangerous mains voltage solution, whether I like it or not. At least that approach would allow me to pull as much power as I wanted, without having to worry about temperature coefficients. Even though I would basically have to tell you guys not to replicate what I'm doing because it's dangerous. This is the two pieces of nichrome wire I pulled out of a broken fan heater, and each of these dissipates 1000 watts when connected straight across the mains. A very common configuration in generic fan heaters, you have two heating elements of 1 kilowatt each for a total of 2 kilowatts on the highest power setting. However, if I switch those in series instead of in parallel, the resistance gets doubled and the power halved, which lands me on exactly 500 watts, provided I manage to squeeze all this wire on my build plate. Awesome! Well, there is still a catch. For the same power dissipated across equal lengths of thin wire and thick wire, the thinner wire gets significantly hotter due to the heat being concentrated in a smaller cross section. So if my wire was too thin, it could easily reach temperatures north of 400C and melt right through the capped on tape used to hold it down. However, if the wire is too thick, it's also inherently a lot stiffer and potentially difficult to hold in place with just tape. So, I needed to find out whether this relatively thick wire gets too hot. And I'm really glad I filmed this for my Patreon, because it means I now have something to show to you. I set up an experiment to drive a short length of it with an equivalent power from a laptop power supply to be safe. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, only 700 milliamps flowed instead of the two amps I had calculated. And to make matters worse, the wire did get pretty close to melting the Kapton, even at that reduced power, on top of the fact that the tape wasn't able to hold on at these temperatures and peeled right off the glass. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the end of the mains powered heater. My mom hated the idea anyways, and I certainly couldn't have the heating element delaminate at high temperatures, exposing live wire. The wire was just too thick and too stiff, adding to the fact that I still didn't know how to neatly tape the stuff to a glass plate in the first place. But this test was also my salvation, because despite running on reduced power, the glass over the heating element easily reached 150 degrees Celsius after a few minutes, and dividing the measured wattage by the area the heater wire covered revealed that it was doing so on only 0.152 watts per centimeter squared. So then I realized the 0.4 to 0.6 watts per square centimeter were nothing but a target value because people are too lazy to wait for the bed to heat up. But I could still easily get the job done with much less if I was just patient.
So, the low voltage heater is back on. If 0.152 watts per square centimeter is enough, I technically only need 120 watts to heat this area, even leaving me with some margin for the temperature coefficient. And anyway, I remembered, the temperature coefficient doesn't even matter in the first place, because when the thing is hot already, we won't need the full 160 watts to keep it that way only enough to replenish the heat lost to the environment via convection. So even if the heater tower drops toward maximum temperature, it does not matter. Especially as someone rightfully mentioned in the comments, most of the time a heated bait won't be cranked up to 120 C, but much rather in the ballpark of 60 degrees. I want to clarify, I'm using the number 120 mostly as a reference for all my calculations to make sure I overshoot rather than underperform. But if we don't really need the margin, and I'm willing to maybe not quite reach the 150 degrees I reached in my test, that opens up a whole new possibility. Because in my collection of power supplies, I have this big one from an old laptop with a maximum output power of 120 watts, which should be barely sufficient as well. So we now potentially have two possible power sources, though I'd still prefer to go with the dual voltage solution because I want the safety factor it offers in terms of total power. But how do we physically make the heater? The copper wire has the same problems as nichrome in as it's fairly thick and stiff, doesn't stay on the glass voluntarily, and probably melts through the capton anyway. Well, I thought about many solutions, but the only one that seemed promising was to borrow my dad's tinfoil hat and let the big bad 5G do the work. Well, I thought about many solutions, but the only one that seemed promising was common household tinfoil. I could cut my heater serpentine out of common aluminum foil and really easily tape it to the glass because it's so thin and light, instantly eliminating 90% of the physical design challenges associated with wire. Since it's so thin with a huge surface area, the heat transfer to the glass would be much more efficient, effectively preventing the aluminum from getting hot enough to melt the capton. So, I cut a random serpentine shape out of some tin foil and taped it to a pane of glass to see if that would work. And those tests were pretty conclusive. Good heat distribution, simple design allows for high reliability since there is really nothing to go wrong with it, yada yada yada. Long story short, in terms of design, definitely the way I wanted to go. But ironically, especially for a design as simple as aluminum foil taped to glass, the fabrication process was, and still is to this day, lined with challenges. If you ever try to work with aluminum foil, you'll know it's very frustrating how easily it tears. There is no way I would be able to successfully cut out a delicate, square wave shaped heater strip with a pair of scissors without tearing it. But hey, I thought, if I stick the aluminum to the glass using spray adhesive and mask what I want to keep with paint, I could etch everything else away in a sodium hydroxide solution, just like you would etch a PCB, and then apply the capton to permanently hold it in place afterward. Sounds good, right? Well, nothing doing. The only thing that got etched away was the masking paint. No joke, I even briefly considered crude wire EDM, but as it turns out, it's way easier to just directly cut the aluminum layer on the glass with a knife. So the obvious solution would be to convert my pen plotter into a vinyl cutter, use it to cut the outlines, and then peel away everything I don't want? No, because in the time of building a drag knife and figuring out how to get the stupid offset for it working in the software, I could cut out five heater serpentines by hand. And so that's where I decided to leave it at and jumped into FreeCAD to sketch out a design. Yes, I took it as an opportunity to finally start learning to use real CAD software. Now, even the CAD design process was complicated enough, I'm sure I could fill an entire video just talking about the calculations, so we're gonna skip most of it, especially since I don't have any footage to show you. But pretty early into the layout of the 5V trace, I hit another roadblock. How do you calculate width and length of a trace if all you have to work with is the specific resistivity of aluminum? I'm sure it can be done somehow, but if it requires anything more than simple algebra, I'm not gonna. 
Besides, there is no point. All this math is nothing but a pipe dream that immediately comes crashing down like a house of cards if my real world aluminum foil just happens to be an alloy with a slightly different resistance. Without concrete numbers measured directly from the very aluminum foil I'm going to use, I can't do anything. So to combat that, I took a piece of the foil, covered it entirely in tape to be able to cut it without constantly tearing it, and cut it into a very long 10 mm wide strip. It's 7.1 meters or about 23 and a half feet long. Long enough to have a measurable resistance of 1.834 ohms. And with that number, I was able to work out the exact resistance per centimeter a 10 mm wide strip of this stuff has. That allowed me to finish my model with the relative certainty that the result would end up having a resistance at least in the ballpark of what I had calculated. I used parametric modeling to be able to adjust the width of the traces after the fact in order to dial in the resistance after making a prototype. However, while this looks very promising, there is still two glaring issues. In addition to the general drawbacks of low voltage, high current systems I talked about earlier, 19 amps is significantly more than I can measure with my standard 10 amp multimeter. In other words, I will never know how much current actually flows through either of my heating elements. And hold your horses in the comments, I'm not going to buy a clamp meter just for this project. And because we have two separate heaters on one build plate, in a system where the slightest parasitic resistance can result in huge fluctuations of current flow, resulting in a 0% likelihood of one heating element actually delivering the exact power I calculated, the probability of both heaters dissipating an identical power per square centimeter and thus heating their respective half of the hotbed to the exact same temperature is zero as well. And I definitely can't have one half of my heated bed reach 96 degrees if the other is 69. The only way to mitigate this would be independent temperature control of both heating elements using two thermistors, which can theoretically be done using a second hot end output on Marlin, according to some forum posts I've read, but that would mean using the software in a different way than intended, and I'm not going to do that. The pen plotter was a nightmare to deal with software-wise, and I have no desire to repeat that. Which led me to the conclusion, we're going to drop the dual voltage approach once again, and this time, for good. Let's be honest, it was a bad idea. And like I said in episode 7, it is, is not, not going, going to work, work for several reasons. reasons. Let me introduce you to my ultimate plan. For the heated bed, we're going to use the laptop power supply. And max it out, obviously. It's only single voltage, but at 19.5 volts, the heating element needs to have a full 3.17 ohms to get the 6.15 amps flowing, so any parasitic resistance doesn't represent nearly as much of an issue. Plus, 6 amps requires much less thick supply cables and can easily be measured with a normal multimeter. Yes, you heard me right. This power supply will be dedicated to the heated bed, so the rest of the printer will need some power as well. And here comes the crazy bit. The hot end and Z-axis motor will have their own 12 volt supply, which at 3.8 amps can deliver just a little bit more than the 3.4 amps needed for the hot end. The X and Y axis motors will be driven by this 24 volt supply I pulled out of a Canon scanner. It was originally dead, which is why the unit was chucked, but I quickly found the shorted diode and repaired it. So now I can use it. And lastly, for the electronics and extruder, we will need a 5 volt supply. Absolutely insane to use four separate power supplies to drive one 3D printer. But as you'll agree, in this situation and not wanting to shell out for a 750 watt power supply, this is not only the most reasonable solution, but also the most accessible to everyone. And it should also be the most environmentally friendly solution, since almost every device nowadays comes with its own power supply, they get thrown away by the hundreds. In fact, all of these came from various e-waste collection bins in my area. And since switch mode power supplies usually outlive the thing they're supposed to power, your chances of finding a functional one are about 80%. And besides, the ATX power supply technically comprises three separate power supplies as well. They're just on the same circuit board. But back to the heated bed. We're gonna stick with the aluminum foil spray glue to the glass. 
The heater design I came up with for this new power supply is much simpler and to transfer it onto the aluminum in order to cut it out by hand, I will either use the 3D printer itself as a quick and dirty pen plotter to sketch it on or I may just print out a paper template. Haven't fully decided on that yet. Once the entire shape cut out and all the unwanted aluminum peel away, we'll need to accurately measure the resistance. And if it's not exactly what I need it to be, I have to tweak the width of the trace and start over. Yes, it'll be a pain in the butt, but even for designing PCB heaters, there doesn't seem to be a proper procedure or program to do it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Either way, usually you'd adapt the supply voltage to the resistance you ended up with, but in this case we're forced to do it the other way around, and unfortunately the quickest way seems to be trial and error based on the math we did earlier as a starting point. With the right resistance, we can cover the entire heater in this wide cap on tape I specifically purchased for this, subtract $4.90 from the budget, and that should be it. Super simple design, fabrication-wise, mm, not so much, but the simplicity of having just three layers total is definitely worth it in my opinion. Add 10 cents of screwed aluminum foil from several attempts at getting the resistance right into the mix, and we should be at $5 total for the heated bed from scratch. Only half of my allotted budget. So that's my plan for the next episode. I hope you enjoyed this story time. I needed to get all this off my chest for the build process to have a reasonable foundation. As some of you guys may know, I strongly believe in the saying, knowledge is power. So if it seems like I'm pointlessly rambling about failed attempts, I'm really trying to inspire original thinking and problem solving. No idea if that works though. A special thank you to my patron, now plural because welcome to a second one. I'm really glad I didn't put a sponsorship on this video. They did ask me if I wanted to renew the contract, but I said, you know what? I think I could do with a break for a change. Rough approximation of what I said. Don't get me wrong, sponsorships are great, but consistently coming up with an original integration can be quite stressful as well. And on that note, see you next time. Bye bye!